Hey guys, Matt, Iron Trap Garage, and today we're gonna do another entry in our Hot Rodding 101 video series that uh, everybody seems to like, I think. So today, we're gonna be doing a talk about Oldsmobiles. We've been getting a lot of uh, people asking about Oldsmobile engines. We did the Flathead uh, Cadillac. I think that's what we've done so far. Uh, now we're gonna do Oldsmobile. So these are some of the most common uh, engines that you were seen using in the era of hot rods that we focus on. So uh, as with all of these videos, I'll remind you with the Hot Rodding 101 videos, we are not doing a end all video here. So you're not going to see me talk about every single little detail about Oldsmobiles. I'm gonna kind of glaze over everything, give you a little bit of my opinion, a little bit of historical stuff, and, uh, and just hopefully give you some tips if you guys are thinking about putting an Olds in a early hot rod or custom. So um, the Oldsmobile engine was basically one of the first uh, overhead valve engines. Studebaker was basically the first one then. Uh, GM kind of jumped in with the Cadillac and Oldsmobile. So much like the Cadillac engine, um, Oldsmobile in 49 was basically when they came out with the Olds overhead valve V8. And until the small block Chevy came out, I feel like Oldsmobile was the engine of choice. Uh, they were very plentiful. I think the Oldsmobiles are a little less expensive than the Cadillacs. So it was easier to find them and get them in junkyards. And you see them in like, when you look at old photos, and old magazines, I would say hands down Oldsmobile is probably the most common one. And the other nice thing is they were pretty easy to adapt into early Fords and, and uh, Mercury's and, and things like that with people that were uh, commonly customizing and hot riding cars. So we're going to jump right in, talk about the different types of Oldsmobile engines. We're going to focus mainly on the Series 1 or generate first generation of, of um of Oldsmobile engines, which kind of ends right around 64, which is where we stop a lot of our uh, style of hot rods and customs. So let's get started. All right, so the first Oldsmobile basically that came out with the V8 that we're gonna focus on is the 303 Olds. And that was the little guy that came out, but it was a huge improvement. With horsepower that basically matched a very hopped up flathead, it was pretty cool. The torque ratings were through the roof compared to uh, what you could get at a stock form in other vehicles at that time. So uh, an Oldsmobile was an obvious choice. They were meant to be in large vehicles. And even though they were a small cubic inch for what we're used to for overhead valve V8s nowadays, um, they still put a lot of power out at their time. And it was obvious why it was a, a nice choice. They, they ran smooth, they ran cool in, in stock form, um, and they put out a lot of torque, which was really nice. Now the uh, 49 to 53, 303 Olds um, that you see is a really, really popular choice. They're very distinctive with the valve covers um, that you saw in those early uh, Olds rocket engines. Um, and in a lot of those photos, you see that the 303 was used quite commonly. Now the early uh, 49 to like 51-ish um, maybe 52, but I think it was 51. Um, Oldsmobile engines, especially the 49s, have some small differences internally than the later engines. So there are some factory hop-ups you can do to those 303s that we'll talk about um, in, a, in a few moments. Uh, but those engines you wanna definitely look at when you're looking at the age of your engine. If you have a first year only engine, like everything first year only, there are some differences or some things that are not as good that you wanna take a look at. Um, so there's a lot of things like the rods um, that are not quite as strong that they say, but if you're using just uh, a street car, it's totally fine. You can run them, hop them up, and they do handle a little bit of beating, but it is something to keep in mind if you're building something that's a little higher end. Uh, you may wanna look at the internals of your engine, find exactly what year your engine is so that you make sure you're using um, the best push rods, rocker arms, rods, um, and, and everything else in that. So the next one in the first generation of Oldsmobiles is the 54 to 56 324s. Now that is probably one of my favorites because that's kind of like the golden era right before and right when Chevy came out with their small block engine and it was very, very competitive. So uh, if you think of an early small block engine versus an Olds, the Oldsmobile had quite an advantage over those early first, you know, 55 to seven or 55 six especially uh, Chevy engines, the Oldsmobiles had a pretty good advantage and I think they were actually a 
you know, definitely were beating a lot of Chevys at that time, which was really nice. So the 324 uh, pretty much interchanges all of its parts with the 303 engine. So you can swap around cylinder heads, the intakes, a bunch of different parts on them you can swap over. One factory upgrade is the rocker ratio. Uh, on the early 303 Olds, it was a 1.5 rocker ratio um, versus a late, the late, the 324s got a 1.8. So it was a factory upgrade that you could do like hop up upgrade back in the day is you could take the stock parts out of like a 324, put it in the 303 and have a nice little upgrade and you would oftentimes see that. And by doing that, you didn't actually have to change the valve covers or anything like you would have to do when you get adjustable uh, rocker arms when you start changing out with a solid lifter cam and all that stuff. You have to change the valve cover and it becomes a little more involved and a lot more expensive. So guys would just go to the junkyard, scavenge those parts, or even at that time you could go off right in the dealer, order those parts, swap them out, have a nice little upgrade for your engine when you're just swapping out cams and everything. So the 324 engine, uh, again, is, is pretty much the same. You can identify it by basically the numbers on the block. There's some other ways you can identify it. Also, the cylinder heads on all of these Oldsmobile engines, they pretty much from the first 303, well, I, uh, I should say the, the early 303s were not stamped on the heads, but after the real early uh, 303s, the Oldsmobile engines, the heads were basically stamped in, in like around the center port. You could see there was a number that was stamped. And as that number went up, basically it's a better head as you go. That's a kind of a, my broad way of saying this without going too much down the rabbit hole. But if you go into what everybody wanted and it was, a, you know, the thing that you would see in the old magazines, they would write them, the number 10 heads. So a 56 324 had basically the best heads, you know, factory that you could get. They had big valves, they flowed better, and you could swap these parts over to the earlier engines and you could, again, do like a factory hop up or if you were hopping an engine up, that was definitely the better heads to put on. And that is still the case nowadays if you're building up an early style Oldsmobile. If you can look for those heads, it's definitely uh, the best case. But even just swapping over to like a 54, um, 53, 54, 324 heads are better than like the early 303 heads. So you can do a little bit of modifying uh, of just changing around gaskets and things like that, but they basically will bolt right on and you can get bigger valves better flowing performance and is a nice uh, complementary upgrade with doing a camshaft and some of the uh, you know more carburation that you would see commonly. Now the big boys in the first generation of Oldsmobile V8 engines is the 371, 394 Olds engines and most commonly thrown around turn is the J2. This is when the famous Olds J2 engine came out with the 371s and that was a factory higher compression 3-2 carburetor setup that uh, came, you know, right in an Oldsmobile was an option, kind of expensive option that you could get, and uh, that was the hot rodder's choice. So pretty much all of the big uh, stories that you hear, the folklore over the day, every every guy's hot rod had a J2 in it, whether it did or ac actually did or it did not, everything had a J2 back in the day, and in all the magazines you read, it's old J2. So once you step up into the 371, uh, 394 era is when you get into, uh, things start changing a little bit. now. Basically the block and, and the heads will all interchange with some modifications, but the deck height was actually higher on these. So you cannot just do a direct swap with intake manifolds and things like that. Once you swap over to this series, uh, you know, kind of like mid um, era of these engines. So um, now you could interchange the 371, 394, but if you're trying to go with an earlier 303 engine, you can't take like a factory J2 setup and just bolt it on and go. Because of the deck height, there is differences, so they cannot swap over. A lot of other parts are interchangeable, like the valley covers and some things like that, but that is the most common mistake when you're shopping for like speed equipment, swap meet, eBay, different things like that. Make sure you're checking out what the intake is because you may buy an intake that is for a earlier engine and it may not fit onto your later engine. So if you wanted to build an engine that was really fast and you could beat everybody in your town and also was very fast at the drag strip, you would start with a 371 or 394. These things made a ton of power and a ton of torque right out of the box. So you could take a factory J2 engine, drop it in a 32 Ford, and you were kind of king shit around town. Uh, and then when you start hopping these things up, it just, it just um, substantially started going up from there. And that's when things really started to break. And the, the parts that people were swapping in using a factory flathead style trans and rear, when you got into these engines, that's when you really started breaking things because they made so much more power than a flathead. The 303, the early 303 engines, they didn't, again, they made like 
uh, a hopped up flathead kind of power. So those engines weren't as bad with braking things. But when you got into this larger um, cubic inch Oldsmobile era is when you really started to brake things. So again with these, it, it follows along with the numbers on the head um, and also on the block. You can tell the year of your engine and you can take um, you could take the block from a 371 and bore it out, make a 394, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these parts all interchange around. So that's the easiest way to remember if you're just getting into this stuff is, is the 371, 394, kind of a lot of parts are interchangeable within reason. The 303, 324, uh, 54 to six, uh, 324s are kind of that way. So they all interchange. So um, now the uh, J2 engines, again, it was really just the intake and a, and a bump in compression. And then, of course, you know, you can look at the cylinder heads to see what, what number they are. Um, but basically, it was just kind of like bolt-on upgrades that they got to get that J2 engine set up. So there's no, like, crazy um, in-depth uh, engine secrets in these things other than just normal stuff. Of, I think it was a thinner head gasket they put on that bumped the compression up a little bit. And then, of course, those three twos. A lot of people that probably bought those cars and had the three twos on them in factory form didn't even really use them because they you know it didn't really come in till like the throttle was i don't know three quarters of the way down and a lot of people driving Oldsmobiles probably weren't doing that in factory form all right so now that we went over the basics of the engines in the era that we're kind of getting into with we focus on with these cars in the traditional hot rod and custom uh world uh, we're going to get into some of the top tips or things i've come across when putting an oldsmobile in an early ford this 32 ford here is my first one that i've had that i've actually gotten running and it's basically basically ready for the road. Um, so it was a big learning experience, even though I've had Oldsmobile engines and speed equipment. Uh, there's some things that I've learned along the way. And again, with the Hot Rodding 101, I wanna share some of that with you because I've learned some things the hard way and the expensive way. So uh, we're gonna go through some of those tips and hopefully they're helpful for, for you. So number one, we kind of hit on it a little earlier, the intake difference. So uh, everybody, especially if you're building a high rod or a custom, you want to put an intake with multiple carburation. Even though these engines run very well on a two barrel or a four barrel, um, everybody, you know, a lot of us want to put three twos, four twos, whatever, and that's half the fun with hot rodding is getting all the little trinkets and speed parts and things to bolt on. So intakes, I. Uh, do get broken down because of the difference in the ports, can get broken down even further into the year that they were made. So the 303s, some of the early engines, the port shape is a little different than even the 324s. So some of the earlier intakes actually have a difference in that when you look up the part number, if you have an old you know speed equipment catalog or something like that. But again, a kind of rule of thumb is the 303, 324 era, they pretty much will all interchange um, as far as how they bolt up. When you get into the later 371, 394, those intakes, they fit all of those engines, but they do, do not easily interchange. The only exception to that rule is if you're getting one of the, like, you build it style intakes, um, where it's just a tubular intake and there's just rubber sleeves between the two halves. With those, you can simply just change those rubber sleeves and you can put those intakes because they will bolt up as far as the flange pattern, but it's actually the deck height that actually changes everything. So you can change those sleeves and that will um, allow you to fit those intakes. But a lot of those intakes, unfortunately, pretty much all of them, I think, are like 6'2 intakes. So it is a lot of carburation for an engine unless you're building something that's all out. Six Strombergs is a lot it is a lot, so and it's a kind of a headache to run. So um, as far as the intakes and speed equipment goes, when we're touching on the intake thing. Uh, two two intakes are very hard to find. Uh, really, it seems like they only made two two intakes on like really early. Uh, some of the earliest old speed equipment, some of the earliest intakes seem to be those two two intakes. Um, and you can pretty much all the, the normal manufacturers made them, Edelbrock, Offenhauser, the most common ones you're gonna see, but you do get into some pretty neat, rare stuff when you get into uh, Oldsmobile stuff. So there's like a horn intake, I think Edmunds had a 2.2, and some of those are pretty neat. So if you're building an early style rod, uh, you can get one of those earlier intakes with 2.2 carburetors, and it's uh, you know, kind of neat uh, to have just two carburetors on there because it, it just leans towards the earlier hot rods when Oldsmobiles first came out. Um, now when you get into the later uh, intakes, they're actually far less common for whatever reason. The 371, 394 intakes, unless they're like the 6.2 style, you you build it type intakes. Um, it seems to be that they're a lot less common. You start seeing two fours 
and things like that because when they got into that era, they, the, the engine started getting quite large and you hop them up, you, you, it's just much easier to just go to two four barrel carburetors and that is plenty of fuel. Um, so when you're shopping for it, it's, that's why I've kind of leaned when I built this car towards the 324 uh, because it was a lot easier to find speed equipment and parts versus the other engines um, other than when you're doing like a factory J2 setup, it's a lot harder to find a 3.2 intake uh, when you're out there searching. All right, second thing is when you get into the valve trains. So um, if you wanna put a solid lifter cam into one of these engines and you need to get adjustable push rods or adjustable rockers. Back in the day, adjustable rockers was kind of the thing. And uh, we mentioned a little earlier, you can do a, you can do a stock um, changeover or hot rodding of these engines by just changing the rockers and the push rods to the larger and different ratio. But if you're looking into getting a cam, when you get into the adjustable rockers, the problem that happens is they will actually hit the valve covers in stock form. So if you put adjustable rockers on a stock old valve cover, it'll actually hit the valve cover and will cause a problem. Now there was some small series of race engines as they made uh, in the Oldsmobiles that came stock with factory, you know, racing adjustable rockers and they had dimpled in uh, valve covers uh, that came factory. There's very, very few of those out there. Now I do know that Iski uh, advertised, I've seen them sold old catalogs that they were selling chrome dimpled valve covers with the rockers and one of their camshafts. I don't know if they bought, bought out, they were buying like factory olds parts or they bought them out and they were selling them or if they were actually making them themselves, but they have nice little dimples in them that um, is kind of cool when you see that on, on a car with a factory um, valve cover. Now it's not uncommon to see old hot rod engines where they take two valve covers and they cut them apart and section them and, and add height to them or add spacers underneath of them. There's all kinds of things that guys did just to get their engine together and get it to run. I'm sure a lot of guys put these things together with their new ISKI cam and their rockers and everything and went to put the valve cover on and it didn't fit and they were like, ah, screw it, let's torch it and you know, add a piece of plate in there. Now, the other thing you can do that is why you see on a lot of these uh, Oldsmobile engines having finned valve covers is because a lot of the finned valve covers were made taller to have clearance for adjustable rockers. So that's why they were so popular. There's all different brands that made them that are out there from you know, Moon, from Edelbrock, Offenhauser, all different brands made them over the years. Valve covers can get very, very expensive when you get into the rare ones and that's half the fun with the Olds and Cadillac stuff is finding that it's obscure parts when you're searching for that. All right, third little tip is uh, it's gonna be a little longer, but it gets into when you're running transmissions and clutch and the clutch setup for Oldsmobile. So the earlier Oldsmobile engines, um, 303, 324, uh, they were externally balanced uh, versus the later 371, 394, which were internally balanced. What this means to you is if you're trying to put a stick shift uh, transmission behind, behind an Olds, that is an early engine, it's no big deal because it's externally balanced. You can just put a bio aluminum flywheel or a factory one, bolt it on, boom, no problem, no different than like a flathead or some other engines. Now, when you get into the later engines that are internally balanced, 371, 394, really ideally the, the flywheel should be balanced with the, the rotating assembly. So that becomes a problem. The other thing is if you have a 371 or 394 and you wanna put a stick shift transmission behind it, if the engine is not a factory stick shift engine, it will not have provisions for a pilot bushing. And you cannot just, even though I've heard of guys doing it, you not just take a drill and drill a hole in the end of your crankshaft for a pilot bushing. It's A, gonna wear the pilot bushing out really quick or it's going to cause some vibrations and problems. So um, that is another reason that I kind of lean towards the earlier engines. It's a little bit easier to put um, a stick shift transmission behind it. Once you got into the later engines, it was kind of uncommon to see a stick shift Oldsmobile. Um, the one that really, that, that was very sought after for factory stick shift transmissions for Olds is the 50 Olds. It's basically internals are a LaSalle transmission. It just has a really short tail shift on it. So it's a very strong transmission and has a short tail shift that can be switched over. Uh, speaking of LaSalle transmissions, they do bolt right up to an Oldsmobile engine if you have that 50 old style bell housing. You can bolt it right on and then bolt your LaSalle transmission on. It has the same bolt pattern. Uh, it also has the same bolt pattern as, a cat as the early Cadillac engines that have the extended bell housing. They do interchange. So that makes it kind of nice when you're looking for adapter plates and things like that. You can, uh, there is a little bit more out there in the world. Uh, there is a lot of just thin plate adapters to put in an Olds 
or Cadillac right up to a Ford 39 style transmissions transmission which does work but be warned that you will break transmissions if you start really hopping these things up and running them with a Ford box. So the LaSalle transmission, 37 Buick, um, 37 Packard, all those transmissions were very strong. There's a lot of adapters floating around out there for those types of transmissions, but you can also, to even today, get adapter kits to put like a T5 or T10 transmission behind these engines. If you're going for something a little more modern, you can go with those and get adapter plates that come with a clutch and all of those different parts. But for the hot early setup, definitely a 37 LaSalle transmission with a 50 Olds tail shaft and the 50 Olds bell housing and that was like what everybody wanted to run and again when you read all the old magazines that was kind of like the hot combo for sure. So as far as putting a Oldsmobile engine in an early Ford, really the biggest problem like all different engine swaps have their own little thing with all the different makes but the biggest thing on an Oldsmobile was the starter was on the driver's side the same as the side steer um, steering box on an early Ford. So when you tried to put the original Olds starter in there, it did not fit. So a common thing, a kit that they would sell, like Hildebrand was a big one that sold it, was a lower bell housing piece that bolted on to put the starter on the other side. And then you could put the starter on the other side and then there's a relocation kit for the oil filter to put a remote oil filter somewhere else, either on the firewall or under the car or whatever you would like. So to find those kits complete is very hard nowadays, but you do see these starter changeovers quite often. It's easy to do to start a re relocation kit. You really can make a plate and weld some bungs on, or you can find the cool old aluminum ones and do that as well. Anything is okay. Now the nice thing with modern technology, so to speak, is that nowadays with having those mini high torque starters, uh, there are some places out there that sell mini high torque starters for Oldsmobile that allows you to put the starter on the left side and you do not have to do all that changing over. But again, if you're going for nostalgia, that is the, you know, kind of the hot setup is to run one of those aluminum lower bell housings or the relocation kit and a factory old starter or GM starter uh, right on the passenger side. So keep an eye out at swap meets. If you see those, they can get pricey depending on when and where and they're selling. Uh, if you can find a complete engine with that whole kit on it, grab it up because all those pieces individually between the flywheel, the lower bell housing, the relocation kit, all that stuff, when it, it's bought individually, it gets very, very expensive. Uh, so if you can find an engine, even if the engine is junk or blown up and has those pieces on it, really, really good to buy it, buy that stuff all together because it'll go right on and it'll save you a lot of time in hunting for those parts. All right, so another thing I came across when I was looking into not only Cadillac but all, and, and Oldsmobile was the, the talk about Studebaker parts and interchange. There's a lot of misinformation out there when you talk to people at swap meets, guys will tell you whatever they need to tell you to sell something even if it's they're not totally uh, aware if it's true or not. So Studebaker parts can kind of fit on Cadillacs and Oldsmobile, but that nothing is a direct fit. So one of the most common things you see talked about as far as Oldsmobile goes is the rocker arms. So Studebaker, the early Studebaker overhead valve engines had factory adjustable rocker arms on them. They are 1-8 ratio, just like the later Oldsmobile was. So in theory, yes, they are, they are can be swapped over and used but you do need to modify them. I think the center hole going through for the, for the shaft is a different diameter, so you need to do some modifications on there. So don't just buy a set of Studebaker rocker arms. I think you're gonna just slide them on your engine that's already running, and in an hour have them swapped over and done. That's, that's not the case. I think you might have to rebush them or something like that, I forget, but it is a cheap way to do it because the aftermarket adjustable rocker arms are getting hard to find. They're vintage. Some of them are broken or damaged or just worn, um, so that is another way to do it if you can find like NOS uh, Studebaker rocker arms or something like that. You can get those, swap them over, and use them. But they are not a direct fit. Intakes are another thing. I've oftentimes seen people say, oh, Studebaker. I've had discussions with older guys at swap meets that were selling intakes and they were uh, kind of spouting off incorrect information. Like, oh yeah, this bolts, this Studebaker intake or swap that. This Oldsmobile intake or Cadillac intake will bolt right on a Studebaker. That is not true. While they, the bolt holes are kind of close and they do 
with modifications could be swapped. It is not a direct swap. So don't go and buy a Studebaker intake and think you're gonna just bolt it right onto your Oldsmobile or Cadillac uh, because it's not going to do that. With how much Oldsmobile speed equipment is floating around out there, it's pretty easy to find an intake, especially if you're doing one like the Edelbrock 3.2. It's probably one of the most common intakes out there. They could be had for fairly inexpensive. I mean, in the I'd say $200 range, $250 range, maybe $300 range, you can find an Edelbrock intake and they're pretty cheap. Same with the Offenhauser stuff. But when you start getting into the more rare stuff like Horn and some of those other brands, they get into $700,000 range, but it is not an issue to find a, an earlier style Olds intake. So don't try and put Studebaker parts uh, or intakes on your Olds engine. You're kind of wasting a rare part to put it on an Olds, it doesn't make sense. All right, so the last thing uh, we talked about, and definitely when it comes to hot running, is the ignition side of things. Uh, there's all kinds of trick ignition systems you can get out there uh, for these old hot rod engines, and Oldsmobile is no different. Now, Oldsmobile did change. Uh, I think it went all the way up to like 58. They had the D-type shaft where it goes down into the engine for the distributor. Uh, and then 59 on, they started using, um, I think like a gear shaft or whatever, but it is a little, a little bit different. So you can change the bases out. So if you're getting a magneto built or something like that, you can change those parts out if you have a distributor, but if you want to take a stock distributor and bolt it right in, make sure you're looking at that shaft at the bottom. If it has the D shaft and you have a 58 or earlier engine, it should bolt right in there and you'll be good to go. But a lot of times, again, I see people selling things at swap meets or on eBay and I'll just put, Oldsmobile Magneto, and they won't say anything about what it is, or early Oldsmobile, and then you look at it, and maybe it actually has the wrong shaft on the bottom, and then you will have to get this changed over, which obviously costs more money. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, trick ignition systems out there. There's dual coils, um, and there's, um, you know, Mallory made a bunch of them that are really, really common. And then, of course, you can just do the normal Vertex Magneto, uh, but that's another fun thing to hunt for for these engines, is you can look for neat Mallory distributors all the way up to putting some kind of trick Magneto set up and even on some of the really neat race stuff even like moon and some of the manufacturers made a front timing cover that you could actually put like a flathead style Harmon collins the big big boy right on the front of there that's really really neat i don't know if it's really doable on a street car but they made all kinds of options on these oldsmobiles because again they were king of the hill for racing and hot riding in the early days up until small blocks kind of take over all right, so that's like my quick crash course on Oldsmobile engines for early hot rods. I know that I missed a ton of stuff. Again, you can go down a crazy rabbit hole getting in all the technical stuff. Uh, number one, there is a great, actually there's a few great uh, threads on the ham. I have referenced the ham all the time because it is a great place to go and get a wealth of knowledge. It's been going for a long time and there's a lot of threads on there that are like, 10 years old to have like everything you need to know. So there are a couple Oldsmobile threads. We'll try and drop them in into the description down below. And that will give you all your nerdy details if you wanna know every little thing um, about the differences. You can read up in there um, and educate yourself, especially if you're trying to build a trick Olds engine, you can definitely learn a lot by reading those. Um, so definitely look at that. But if you're, you're thinking about building a hot rod or a custom with an Olds engine, uh, pretty much if you're looking for this first generation that we've talked about, if you're building a car that's like pre-64 style, you can pretty much go with any of those engines and they are just fine. And uh, just like the old days, you can put a stock Oldsmobile engine in your hot rod and the thing will fly and you can have a ton of fun in it. And it's a little bit different than running a small block Chevy. Uh, so it's always nice when you pull into a show or cruise in and you have an Olds or a Cadillac and it's a little bit different than what the next guy has. If you have any type of tips or information, if you're an Olds engine lover, drop it down below. I'd love to see the conversation below on any tips or tricks or anything you have to say about Olds engines. Or if you have a really cool memory about racing or running around an Olds engine in your hot rod, I know we have a lot of older hot rodders that watch, give us a story down below. I love reading them and we'll definitely try and respond. Thanks guys, appreciate it. Thank you later.